With your host, Andrew Donaldson, this is Heard Tell. Ah, welcome back to Heard Tell. I'm Andrew Donaldson. Thank you so much for giving us the most precious thing you have, your time. So we try to do what we always do, turn down the noise of the news cycle, and boy, is it loud right now. Get to the information we need and try our best to discern the times we live in just a little bit better. And we do that by getting good information and talking, not yelling, not caterwauling, not fussing, just talking about things. That's what we're going to do today on the program. Two guests today on two really interesting topics. Uh, Ann Carpenter, our good friend and attorney, senior editor at Ordinary-Times.com. She wrote a piece that got a little bit of viral attention, got picked up by a couple different outlets called DNA Doesn't Lie, But People Do. Uh, on top of other things, Emma is also a true crime aficionado. And then one of the superstars of the true crime genre of the last few years, Dr. Henry C. Lee, who's been this forensic expert and now his credibility has been called into question. So M. Carpenter is going to join us to talk about that, talk about the CSI era in their quotes of folks and how true crime as an overall genre has developed. M. Carpenter on the program in a little bit. Then Kate Farmer's here, um, does a lot of different things. She's currently interning at AEI. She wrote a piece um, as one of our great young voices contributors about Generation Z and this stereotype and trope that's going around that Generation Z doesn't want to work. Is that accurate? What's behind it? What is different about Generation Z? And when we do these broad brush things about generations, like the boomers did this and Gen X does this and the millennials do this, now it's Gen Z's turn. She is one. We're going to talk about it with Kate Farmer a little bit later on in the program. But let's start with the new batch of Trump indictments. This is the third set of Trump indictments for those of you scoring at home and those of you following along from Logan. Let's just kind of walk through this uh, on a couple of levels. Let's start with the actual criminal part of it, and then we'll talk about the politics in a minute. There's four charges specifically about against Donald Trump here. These are all related to the January 6th stuff. This is also Jack Smith, but this is separate from the document case in Florida. We'll talk about that in just a second. Four counts. Count one, conspiracy to defraud the United States. Count two, conspiracy to obstruct an official proceeding. That would be the counting of the votes during January 6th. Count three, obstruction of and attempting to obstruct an official proceeding under a slightly different statute. And count four, conspiracy against rights. Actually, a civil rights violation, meaning people that would have been defrauded if they didn't vote. The loggers are going to pick through this. Please, 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 before you go off half cocked or you just repeat what a talking head said or you just pound send on whatever that big account you follow on Twitter or Facebook or Instagram or whatever does. Please read this indictment for yourself. It's not that hard. It's up on the front page of Ordinary-Times.com right now. You can find it other places. Read the indictment. The entire indictment's about 45 pages. This is a little bit longer than most indictments. The first couple of pages, though, will get you the gist of it. Read through it. You can also control F and search it. It's in a PDF format. At least familiarize yourself with this document. And at Ordinary-Times.com, we've got all three of the other indictments. Big picture criminally, what's going on with this? This is a different kind of indictment than the secure documents and classified documents case. That case is going to hinge on a lot of evidence. He had these documents. He's not supposed to have these documents. He hid these documents. He didn't want to give us these documents. Here's the video of the documents. It's going to be a very much an evidence-based trial. This proceeding is also going to be evidence-based, but it's going to be heavy on testimony. There's six co-defendants that go unnamed and unindicted in this particular document. Now, they're probably going to get indicted later. There's various theories why they weren't. One is they were trying to get this out as fast as possible. Two is they were hoping some of these flip. There's also one big name out there floating that we don't know about yet, and that's Mark Meadows. He was the chief of staff for Trump during January 6th. We know from reporting that he has been cooperating in some form or fashion. 
he is in this indictment, but he's not listed as a co-conspirator. A lot of people taking that to mean he's already cut some kind of a deal. So keep that in mind as well. So how strong is this? Talking to legal folks and reading the indictment, having read the other indictments, I would say, and this is just my opinion, I think the classified documents case is a much stronger, tighter case. This would be the second strongest case. And then the New York uh, case and indictments that Alvin Bragg bought would be a distant third. That case is not nearly as strong. It's rather weak, frankly. That's not just me saying that. That's a lot of lawyer folks. And those are lawyer folks I talk to from across the spectrum. Conservative, progressive, right, wrong, indifferent, purple hippopotamus. That's kind of the consensus. So this would be the second strongest of the three cases. There's probably going to be a fourth case coming in the next few weeks. Um, the Fannie Willis grand jury investigation done in Georgia. If they don't indict Trump himself, it's going to be some, perhaps some of these same people. Uh, but there's an expectation that Trump himself might get an indictment there as well. They said they're going to do that before the 1st of September. We'll see how that goes. So we got four cases, three of them. We got sets of indictments now. That's the legal groundwork that we're looking at right now. The fact of the matter is the classified documents case is currently scheduled to kick off in May. The reason that's important is because the primary is going to be pretty much wrapped up by May when that trial starts one way or the other. So just put a footnote for that. The thing about this particular indictment, the January 6th stuff, there's probably not any way they're going to get this into a trial before the election. To get it in 15 months for a federal case of this scope would be extraordinary. The defense would have to agree to a whole lot of stuff that they would be entitled to to get it done. There's been multiple attorneys and lawyers and experts on these things saying this is probably not going to get done before the election. So the situation criminally as it lays right now is you're going to have the classified documents case first before the election, right after the primary and right as the primary is winding down. And then you're probably going to have this after the election, one way or the other. So keep that all in mind. Politically, what does that mean? Well, right now, Donald Trump, this race for the primary has been very static. Now, things can change, but right now it's very static. This month of August going into September is going to be all Trump all the time. I don't know how much oxygen the other candidates are going to get. Now, a lot can change. As we saw with President Biden himself, he was dead and buried after the first two primaries, one to third, and then ran away with this thing. So we will see what happens. But politically, what's going to happen now is we've already seen the talking points have gone out. The Republican Congress, especially in the House, the Senate's a lot more demurred and a little freer to criticize Trump. But the House of Representatives and the leadership of the House, Kevin McCarthy on down, have all kind of lined up to support Trump through this. They're doing the same old things. And most of the presidential candidates are also, to be blunt here, doing the, oh, well, there's a two-tiered justice system, or this is a politically motivated prosecution and blah, 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 blah. This probably heightens that they're going to try to do an impeachment of Joe Biden, which I think they were going to do anyway. Now I think they're definitely going to do it. So politically, we may be in a situation next year where you have the GOP nominee for the presidency, Donald J. Trump, on trial for one set of indictments, pending trial on another set of indictments, and maybe another set of indictments on top of that. Plus, we got to see what happens in New York with the Alvin Bragg case. Now, let's go back to the criminal for a second. These are just indictments, okay? This is everything that the investigators have laid out and have put forward as the crimes committed. This is not necessarily what gets in the court. Donald Trump is entitled to a defense. They're going to challenge some of these evidences. They'll challenge some of the witnesses. In the classified documents case, for example, they're going to challenge some of the video. They're going to challenge some of the searches. They're challenging things like that. And if some of those things do not make it into the trial, that changes the complexity of how strong the case looks. That case looks very strong. This case, the first count looks pretty workable. The other three counts are going to be a little hard to prove. We've had people on this program. We've had Bart Lyko on this program. We've had M. Carpenter, who's on the program today, talking about another matter. It's going to be really hard, they've said for the better part of three years now, to charge Donald Trump for January 6th related things. Now he has been. Now they've got to prove it. 
So remember, no matter how this looks in an indictment, the defense has their right to discovery. They have their right to challenge the evidence, and they're going to get a presented defense. So what you're reading right now is not necessarily what's going to occur in the trial. So keep your head on that. With all things with this, we've got to keep perspective and be calm and stick with the facts because people are going to hyperventilate over this over and over and over again. So keep the political separate from the criminal because the criminal case is going to be one thing. The political is going to be something else. However, this brings me back to January 6th for just a moment. I wrote a piece at Ordinary Dash Times on January the 7th about what I felt about January 6th. I will link to it in the Substack notes. Please go to herdtel.substack.com and you'll be able to read that full piece. I reread it occasionally. I've reposted it a few times over the years. I have not found anything to change my mind from what I wrote on January the 7th about what happened January the 6th. I wrote it the next day, some of it that night, but most of it the next morning, and I posted it. I haven't changed my mind on any of it. We all know what we saw. We now have over a thousand court cases of the people that were involved. Some got prison sentences, some got deferred sentences, some got acquitted, but we have a thousand court cases of who was involved. We know what happened. There was a large group of people that got caught up in the moment. There was a smaller group of that that broke into the Capitol. No, they shouldn't have been there. doesn't matter that they walked through there peacefully. They knew they shouldn't have been in there. Didn't do any damage, just walked around and left. They should be treated one way. Then amongst that group, there was a smaller group that was there to do violence and did do violence and did do property damage and did break things and tear things up and attack police officers and things like that. And they needed to be dealt with in a different way than the other groups and more severely. And they have been. And then there was a very small group of people, somewhere around 15 to 20 of them, who really were there thinking they were going to overthrow the government or overthrow the election or some other nonsense and have an actual insurrection. Not everybody there was doing the same thing. That's the breakdown of it. Now we have the criminal cases to show it. That's why there's only a small handful of people that have actually been convicted of things like conspiracy and sedition. Most of those folks got what would be called nuisance things. They went in, they walked around, they didn't do any real damage, they just shouldn't have been there, and that's what they got charged with. We have all this evidence. The other evidence we have, even before this, and this put some color in the lines, but it didn't give us a whole lot of new stuff in this indictment, Donald Trump sat there and did nothing for hours to stop this. It was clear that he and or at least some of his staff was encouraging this and was hoping it would help his cause. It is clear that he had a dereliction of duty on that day. I have said it before and I said it again. They should have impeached him right on the spot for the way he behaved on January 6th, absent everything else that happened. I'm fine with this indictment. Donald Trump is entitled to a defense. And we will see how it plays out in court. And that's where we need to leave it. Don't get caught up on this nonsense that he can't get a fair trial. Donald Trump is in a two-tier justice system. He's in the upper tier. He has privileges nobody else would be getting. You can say he's being politically targeted. That's probably partially true. But he's also the only president of the United States to ever do anything remotely like this. So, yeah, he got a target on his back. He put it there. Now, if we find some prosecutorial misconduct in here, we'll call that out as well. But as it stands right now, these indictments, they have merit. That is not a conviction. And Donald Trump will be entitled to his day in court, even though we know what he did was morally wrong. And we know January 6th was terribly wrong. Is it going to be a criminal conviction? That'll be up to the court system. And it's going to be a very long time before we know that for sure. And we have a couple other court cases probably before we get there. Read the entire indictment for yourself. Keep your head. Keep your bearing. Don't get caught up in the politics of that, which are a parallel but separate thing from what's going to be happening in these courtrooms. And we'll see how this develops. We'll continue to follow it. And we're going to do it with a clear eye and a clear head and keeping our bearing on what's actually going on in these court cases, because that's how we're going to get to the truth. And that's how we're going to understand what's happening now And in the historical content years from now, we'll be able to look back and say, yeah, we didn't know everything, but we handled that pretty well considering what we didn't know. More Hertel right after this.
Ah, uh, welcome back to Herd Tell. Okay, one of my personal favorites, because she's also serves as my editor. She's the senior editor at Ordinary-Times.com. She is a lawyer, but she is not your lawyer, so all her legal advice does not apply to you. Do not try to claim it does, unless you're going to pay her for it first. Kim Carpenter, how are you, ma'am? I'm doing well, Andrew. How are you? Good. Good to have you back. All right. You're in your wheelhouse at Ordinary-Times.com. This piece actually got picked up by a couple different outlets and got some coverage. Um, you are a true crime aficionado on top of being one of them lawyery kind of people. You like this stuff. You watch forensic files. You listen to all these podcasts. You read about true crime stuff. For folks that don't know who Dr. Henry Lee is, who we're going to be talking to, the true crime genre, for lack of a better word, of the last, oh, I don't know, 20, 30 years, and especially in the what we called before when we've talked to you, the CSI era, the era where people are really understanding how criminal investigation works, at least the Hollywood version of it, of things like DNA testing and things like this. A lot of the true crime folks know who this person is, this Dr. Henry Lee. He was kind of a celebrity in a lot of ways, and now he's found himself into some trouble. Yes. Dr. Lee has been um, sort of a, a rock star in the forensic science world going back to the 1980s. Uh, really made a name for himself when the defense called him as a witness in the O.J. Simpson trial in the 90s. Uh, and he had testified critical of how some of the bloody evidence was collected at the scene of um, the murders of Nicole Simpson and Ronald Brown. And he sort of uh, painted a picture of some cross-contamination and sort of made that DNA evidence that seems so strong, uh, kind of cast it in a dubious light. And uh, some of the jurors were swayed by that. We know how that turned out. And that's kind of where he became well-known. Uh, he was actually featured in the very first episode of Forensic Files when he was... Um, he was the director of the Connecticut State Crime Lab, and he had actually uh, helped to secure a conviction in a murder case of a woman named Hell Crafts, whose body was never found, but he was able to prove of her disposal via wood chipper. He was able to find remnants, and um, you know that was sort of a the case that picked off the forensic files and he was on I think four episodes over the years and just very well known he consulted on uh, many cases including John Benet Ramsey case I think he was involved in the early stages of the Kaylee Anthony case so definitely a well-known name so for him to have some doubt cast on his credibility which we can get into how that came about uh, it's, it's big news in, in the true crime world. Yeah, and the reason it's big news is because what he's being accused of is a case from back in the 80s. So it predates his fame in a lot of ways. So yes. you can see where people go. We're like, well, wait a minute. If he has this wrongdoing, whether it was negligent or malicious or whatever, something didn't go right here. That's that part we know. That, yeah. predates, that predates everything else. So if that was bad, then everybody's going to call him the question. And you've dealt with this as a prosecutor before, and you use a real life example we'll get to in a minute. Now you got to go back and question everything. And that's where the problem comes in. Right. Yes. Uh, and then, and that's just to, to give some context about what he's been accused of doing and what a, a federal judge has found him uh, not guilty, but liable for. Is, this was a 1985 case. It was a very bloody murder, 27 stab wounds, I believe, including one to a jugular vein. So a very bloody scene. And Dr. Dr. Lee, in his role with the as a state uh, forensics investigator, came to the crime scene, did some testing. Um, there, was, in particular, there was a towel in the in a bathroom on the scene that he said it looked like it had blood stains on it, and he. Um, says he did some sort of a field test and that it was positive for blood. And that was important because the defendants in the case were found without blood on them. Um, and so he had not only testified later in their trial that it was possible for them to have committed this very bloody crime and had no blood on themselves, but there was also, it seemed like if maybe a theory that this towel had been used for cleanup. So at the time that he had supposedly collected this evidence or tested this towel, they didn't have any suspects in mind. So it wasn't a case where he went into court and said, you know, we found the, the victim's blood on the defendant and specifically uh, pointed a finger at these guys. 
However, you know, it was part of the state's case that perhaps this towel that had had blood on it was used uh, to clean up, and that's why the defendants didn't have blood. So fast forward after these men spend decades in prison, and there's additional testing conducted, and now they say this towel, which has been sitting in evidence for decades, has no blood on it. And so that is the part that is shedding some um, dubious light on Dr. Lee's credibility is they're now saying, well, he said that he he field tested this towel and it had blood on it. Testing now says there was no blood. Dr. Lee says that's ridiculous. It's been sitting in evidence for 20 years. There's been degradation. I stand by what I said back then. The problem is there's no trail, no paper trail, no records other than his testimony about this alleged field testing, which isn't really unusual. Field testing um, may not necessarily leave a paper trail, but that's neither here nor there uh, because these uh, men who were released from prison rightfully sued for their wrongful convictions and incarceration and the judge in their their lawsuit uh, made a finding a summary judgment meaning without a, a jury having to try the facts of the case that yes dr lee's testimony was incorrect or wrong or misrepresented the facts and that he was liable and now it's just up to a jury to decide um, money damages So that's where we are, and that's what um, has people left thinking, well, if he lied or misrepresented or did this testing and was wrong, you know, what does that mean about all the other stuff that he has testified and all the other scientific evidence he's presented? M. Carpenter joining us. This piece is at Ordinary-Times.com. We're going to link to it. Here's the problem. And this is a hard question because the technology, look, the technology we're talking about with DNA testing from 85 to the day, that's night and day. That's medieval to space age. It's it's a total gap. Mm -hmm. How much of what we're talking about here, because we can get in the weeds on the details of it, how much of it when you're talking about these lab testing, when you're talking about contamination, cross-contamination, degradation from sitting on a shelf, how much of this stuff is just human error that's not even malicious it's just people didn't know what they were doing there was incompetence people cut corners things like that and then where is the line legally of malfeasance criminality and doing really bad things here because it seems like there's a big mess in the middle there where folks really don't know where that line is even the experts right and and it it is and that's what it comes down to is a battle of the experts when you have a big case like this and you have experts on both sides you, and one is saying well these are my findings and then the other expert is saying your findings are wrong because and then we get down to basically a jury deciding which expert they find more credible or more likable or you know for whatever reason it's hard to say what causes a jury to believe one over another and it's not always um what you <laughs> what you would expect so um and juries love that that scientific evidence and so it, it's really important um in court you know you want your expert to win that battle of the experts because that's going to often be the deciding factor for a jury and apparently in you know for example the oj case they believe dr lee um over the expert pres- provided by the state and that was before anyone really knew who Dr. Lee was. He may have been well known in his field, but he wasn't a household name. So, you know, it's crucial that the experts that are being put up in in front of juries on these cases know what they're doing and that the facts that they're presenting are accurate. Um, But even then, you know, you're subject to the whims of a jury, which is (laughs) a whole other episode. But it's crucial that um, experts can be trusted and that they are presenting the science in in a neutral and appropriate light. And as I mentioned in my piece for Ordinary Times, the prosecution's expert witnesses usually are state employees. They, They are, you know, it's the state police crime lab, not the neutral disinterested third party crime lab that is um, usually bringing these results. So, you know, it's and and on the other hand, defendants are paying these experts, but if they're uh, an indigent defendant and they have a court appointed lawyer, they don't have a lot of money, then you're back to the state paying that expert, which is always something that, you know, um, jurors should keep in mind. So in, in weighing the neutrality of a witness, because if they're a paid expert, then you think, well, they're just just testifying to the facts um, that they're being paid to testify to. And, you know, it, it's it gets tricky. It gets dicey. So that's why it's so important that the integrity of the experts that are being presented is uh, in, impeccable.
joining us, attorney, senior editor at Ordinary-Times.com. This gets to a bigger question about our legal system, but I like asking the bigger questions with stories like this because it's something important. There's really no such thing as a neutral jury. We're supposed to have a neutral justice system. We're supposed to have an adversarial justice system with the prosecution and defense fighting each other. That's the way it's designed. But there's no such thing as a neutral jury because a jury's made up of people and people have biases. That's where you get into this, and you touched in it on your piece. Do you weigh when a wet, when a uh, expert witness is paid or not paid? Do you weigh because somebody's a state employee and might have a built-in uh, bias towards the state? This is all stuff you deal with in a trial. It's an important part of our legal system. Trial lawyers spend a lot of money on how to deal with juries, but then that's also the part that we kind of don't talk a lot about on this stuff because of that CSI effect is just, well, the DNA settles it. No. You still present the DNA, but there's still 12 people you got to convince in there also, right? Right. And we, lawyers do their voir dire, which is their questioning of the jury to try to pick the, the best jurors. And I don't know, other lawyers may be better at it than I was, but I always felt like it was a flip a coin. Um, they <laughs> they always say that if you're a smart person, you're not on the jury because you figured out how to get out of it. Um, I don't know if that's necessarily the case. There's a lot of people who are interested in the criminal justice system or even the civil justice system and, you know, or just feel a, a sense of civic duty and make their way onto a jury. But, you know, you try to pick the most neutral ones, but if they have a, a vested interest in a case, they may want to answer those questions in such a way to make sure that they get on the jury. And, you know, you just never know. Oh, you're they're under oath answering these questions and you hope they're being truthful and honest and you do your best based on your experience or sometimes the advice of other experts on jury selection to try to choose the, the best juror for your case. Um, and you kind of do the opposite and try to strike and get rid of the jurors that you feel are going to have a bias against your client or for a defendant if you're on the prosecution side. Yeah, M. Carpenter. All right, that brings it up. So we got to ask you. You've got to have a jury story, right, where you're just sitting in the courtroom and you're just staring at somebody like, how are you breathing? How are you a functional adult, right? Well, uh, you know, we don't, the jurors don't really participate in the trial. The most you get out of them is the answering the questions in voir dire. And so I don't have uh, a story there. But when I talk about you just never know what's going to sway a jury. Um, when I was a new lawyer and I was trying cases in magistrate court as an assistant prosecuting attorney in a small county here, um, one of the jurors after a trial, which I lost, um, you know, it was a it was a domestic assault case when a man was accused of um, putting his family in fear. And what was happening is the mother was driving in a car and she had kids with her in the back of the car. Or I guess they were in a van and the husband was coming after them driving behind and he was ramming their vehicle from behind. Fortunately, no one was hurt. But there was an assault charge uh, based on, you know, that he was putting them in fear of, of being hurt. And um, the children involved were very young, two or three, four years old. And the question came up from the jury because I had to prove that they were all in fear. That was one of the elements of the crime. And the jury wanted to know, could they just use their common sense of, you know, what they know of children in order to determine whether or not those children would have been scared when they're being, you know, their vehicle they're riding in is being rammed from the back. And somehow that actually ended up in an acquittal um, for the father involved. Uh, I guess the jury didn't think these little kids would be afraid that the, well, the car they were in is being rammed from behind. Um, but in talking with the jury afterwards, um, the one of the um, court personnel said that the juror did not like my outfit. Could not believe what that prosecutor was wearing. Um, <laughs> what I was wearing was a plain black jacket and skirt with a, um, I guess it was kind of like a leopard print shell underneath. It wasn't super bright. It was like a brown and black printed leopard print shell underneath of this black jacket and in and, and the skirt suit. And she just could not believe what that prosecutor was wearing to the point that she, you know, mentioned it to the court personnel. So, you know, I don't know. Did that play into the decision? Did they did they acquit that uh, defendant because they didn't like what I was wearing? I don't know, but they felt enough strongly enough about it to to bring it up. So, 
There you go. So not your lu- not your lucky go to court outfit, I reckon. M. Carpenter joining us. <laughs> this piece has gotten quite a bit of play. It's actually gotten up by a couple different publications. DNA doesn't lie, but people do. It's at ordinary times.com. We will link to it. Uh, let folks know where they can keep up with you and follow you until we get you back on Hertel again. And we're glad to have you back finally, my friend. Yeah, I'm happy to be here. Uh, you can find me on uh, Twitter, and I will call it Twitter forever, WV Esquire S at Twitter. You can uh, clarify if you'd like, but that's where I can be found. Yeah, we're not doing none of that X stuff. <laughs> the always wismonious and lawyery law splainer, M. Carpenter. Thank you so much for the time, ma'am. Thank you. Folks, if you've listened to the Herd Tell program, you've heard our friend Gabriella Hoffman, but you need to make sure you're checking out her podcast, District of Conservation. It's a podcast exploring the nuances of true conservation efforts from D.C. and beyond. From topic discussions to exclusive interviews with conservation and energy newsmakers, Gabriella keeps listeners appraised of the latest news stories while elevating important voices. Listen to District of Conservation on Apple Podcasts or wherever podcasts are played. Religion is at the intersection of our 21st century life, even if we don't express a faith. At a time when it seems that religion isn't as prevalent as it once was, it still leaves its mark everywhere. As a pastor, I know that religion isn't something I just do on a Sunday, but it's found in every nook and cranny of my life. Sexuality, politics, social media, the economy, war, nationalism, all have some kind of religious angle to them. And as a communicator, I want to find the stories that can help people understand this part of our society that is so important to so many. Hi, I'm Dennis Sanders, and I'm the host of Church and Maine. Church and Maine is a podcast about the journey of faith and where it intersects with modern life. I look at faith with a journalist's eye, asking the who, where, what, why, and how religion affects some of the major issues of the day. Join me as we journey together. You can listen to Church in Maine podcast at the website churchinmaine.org or on your favorite podcast app. I look forward to seeing you. Ah, uh, welcome back to Herd Tell. Okay. You've probably heard tell over and over again that there's these generation things. It's actually a pet peeve of mine. The boomers do X and Gen Z does Y and the millennials are doing whatever else. I, I've kind of gotten tired of it. It's a little broad brush, but we're going to talk about Generation Z today. So we're going to need one of them because I'm getting too old to actually relate to those folks. Kate Farmer, uh, she's one of our great Young Voices contributors. Love talking to them. Uh, she's currently interning at AEI, a place I very much like. And also a student at Washington University of St. Louis, who individually sent me more mail as a teenager than anybody else, including family members combined in the mid to late 90s. But that's another story for another day. Kate, how are you? I'm great. It's great to be here. Let's start with the nomenclature here because these things, one of the reason I have a problem with some of the and look, I've wrote them too. The millennials did this, the boomers do this. I've done it too. I'm guilty. Let's start with the nomenclature because I think it's important to understand who we're talking about, and then we're going to talk about why we talk about them the way we talk about them. You is one, you self-identified as one. Give me the nomenclature. What do you consider Gen Z and why is it Gen Z? Yeah, so Gen Z used to be considered 1995 to 2012. Now some places will say 1997 to 2012. Not a huge difference there, but um, Gen Z actually is is kind of born out of the previous titles of Gen X, even though Gen Y got skipped. But Gen Z, formerly by many commentators, was called iGen, which I think is almost a better title for my generation. This sort of anywhere from age... 12 year old roughly up to someone in their mid 20s right now um but igen as i like to call it is really emphasizing you know little uh, lowercase i and then gen it emphasizes kind of us as a product of the technology that's raised us i mean some of the youngest generation here about 12 years or so 12 years old or so is not going to remember a time before a highly advanced iphone 
I don't remember a time before smartphones. I can remember the BlackBerry, and that's about as far back as my memory stretches. And even these older generations are coming of age when iPads, iPhones, iPods are coming out. And so we are really this first generation to grow up and experience and live through adolescence, this tech wave. And that knowledge and that element of my generation is what permeates a lot of my work and what permeates a lot of this piece in particular. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that because I think the gaps now should be event-based more than uh, just the age-based. And the reason I say that is exactly what you just talked about. So like if you take the greatest generation, Depression, World War II, those are generation-defining events, technology jumps, right? The boomers grew up in the TV age, the first of mass media. That's a generational-defining thing. I'm kind of the last of the Gen Xers, technically maybe the earliest of the millennials, but my parents were boomers, so I, I'm more Gen X. Those of us that got out of high school before the internet became a big thing. I graduated in 98. We had it, but it wasn't what it is now. It was still, you know, computer labs, that kind of stuff. That's a generational defining thing. We grew up kind of just with the early parts of the internet. Then I think we have these gap folks before 2006, and I picked that day because that's when we started getting the iPhones, the smartphones. I think you're exactly right. If you grew up in the smartphone, social media version of the internet, that's a generational defining thing that changes everything about you from prior generations. Is that a fair way to put it? 100%. And that's really, I think, the part of our generation that commentators often miss out on is the degree to which we are saturated with technology and just how life-shaking it is to grow up never knowing a world without it. It's kind of makes it easy to blame Gen Z for a lot of our digitized traits. We're a chronically online generation, and the data is showing that we are truly chronically online, like over nine hours of screen time is the average for people above 15 and older, these teenagers in their early 20s. Um, and also, I think that that affects how we think about things and that affects how we process the world around us and our mental health and the way that we regard world events. It's it truly is just like how the boomers are defined by being the baby boom. It's the same for us and it also shows why we as a generation now that we're coming of age are acting and responding to world events and developments around us very differently than any other generation and why gen z really sticks out of the bunch and is looking like it's going to stay that way yeah kate farmer joining us you wrote this piece in spectator we're going to link to it it'll also be in the Substack notes i think you finished with something that's really profound here so i'm actually going to work through your piece a little bit backwards here what you just said, and the piece is about the generation that avoids work, that's broad. There's reasons they avoid work. And I think one of the things, and you just touched on it, some of the stuff and some of those defining issues of the generation we talked about, the technology, there's so much information. They look up, look, I got kids and all four of my children fall in this, <laughs> this grouping, okay? They Google everything you say as soon as you say it to make sure you're saying it right. I think some of the work stuff, it's not just not working. I think they have a knowledge base where they're more picky about things. They expect more. They talk to their peers more because even during things like COVID shutdown, I, I remember talking to my youngest daughter. I'm like, do you miss your friends? Like, no, we talk all day because they're on, you know, they're on discords. They're on, you know, chats. They're doing TikToks. They're connected in such a different way. I don't know that the way they connect and communicate and culturally deal with each other has translated to the work environment. Is that a fair way to put part of this problem? Yeah, that's a very fair way to put it. And there's kind of two factors here when we're looking specifically at Gen Z. Um, the first factor is obviously the digitization of relationships and how Gen Z, more than any other generation by far, it spends most of their relationships online and fills in these crucial phases of one's life that's usually spent in person with other people online. And so there's this digital presence of being the iGen. There's also the pandemic that comes in here too, which is less on Gen Z specifically and just a greater product of all that that's happened because of the pandemic. But those two factors combined, many people my age, I'm 21, who are entering the workforce or starting their jobs this summer or this fall, for many of us, this is the first time we've been in an in-person office environment. Actually, when I showed up to where I'm working right now at AEI, um, one of our panelists asked the, the crowd, they said, how many of you 
is this your first in-person office experience? And this is AEI. It's very competitive to be an intern here. It's a great honor. And still a third of the room or more, almost a half, raised their hand saying, this is my first time I've worked in an office. And the average age of an intern is probably about 21, which is probably pretty foreign to a a lot of older generations who have had some kind of in-person work, whether it's an office or at least a, you know, a Shake Shack or something. And so we have this digital world where we're getting less experience and less in-person social interaction. That's, that's affecting how we relate to others and generally in a negative way, not always, but usually. And then our lack of in-person work experience is making the transition to the workplace for Gen Z, for those who are entering it, a little, a little shakier and a little bit, bit more disruptive than other generations might have come into it. Farmer joining us. You touched on it, and I'm glad you brought this up in your piece. You talk about how the way your generation has, you know, they're you're the first generation that digital media is a natural language, especially social media, this stuff. You talk about how that builds personal autonomy. You're you're you get a very sense of personal autonomy based on what everybody else is doing. And when you hit something like a power structure like the work environment. Y'all just judge it differently. And again, I've seen this in my own children. I've seen it in their friends. I've seen it a little bit as a manager when I was still working. They see power structures differently. And I think that might be a big disconnect, especially with the boomer generation or even some of the Gen X where we were just kind of like roll our eyes and deal with it. Our generation did a lot of that. We're just like, yeah, whatever. Y'all look at power structures very, very differently. And a lot of people just say, oh, that's a bad thing. They need to get over it. Well, okay, you can say that. There's probably truth to that, too. But also some of those power structures, they just see it differently. Why did you put that in the piece? Because I think that's a little bit more profound thing that's not really being talked about a lot. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting to see you phrase it as power structures, because I think that is a really helpful terminology to show this whole mechanism of the working life that Gen Z is just now entering and entering at the bottom level, looking up. And how generations regard the structure really impacts their decisions to enter it, the points at which they're trying to enter, and how they're going to act in the workplace and where they're going to try and end up. And Gen Z is coming in with a more pessimistic view. Generally, this is like large averages. There's also a chunk of Gen Z that's working harder and trying to climb corporate ladders more so than previous generations ever. You know, we're in the test prep, college prep era right now. And so that's a its own functioning group of Gen Z. But the majority of Gen Z aren't in that bubble. And the majority of Gen Z is looking at these sort of power structures of employment. And a lot of them are saying, I don't want that. A lot of them are coming in with this emphasis on on work-life balance, on skepticism of the benefits of corporate climbing and moving up in the workplace. And a lot of them are saying, no, that's not for me. And I think, you know, like a lot of generational trends, this has a good side and a bad side to it. I think Gen Z is really right to look at what work can turn into. And like I'm working in DC right now, there's a lot of people here who make work their life and that it takes this indispensable first place over everything else, including family relationships and just rest. And Gen Z is right, I think, to look at that and be skeptical and be skeptical of the benefits it's really going to give you and the holistic life picture. But on the other side, this is causing a large scale skepticism to work and to employment and to this greater narrative that work is bad for your mental health, that work is, you know, this toxic corporate culture that's not good for you, that you're forced to do, it's going to be a slog. So I think like a lot of generational trends, it's got a a helpful side and a not so helpful side. And this article focuses on the not so helpful side. That's what you don't hear as much, but they're, they're both worth, they're both worth looking at. Yeah, Kate Farmer joining us. You touch on it in the piece. You deal with some of that criticism. You talk about Gen Z being dubbed the most depressed generation. I don't think that's fair for a lot of reasons because a lot of that stuff just went undiagnosed. I don't know that it's more or less. I think it's just something we know more about than previous generations, to be fair. 
but you've seen these numbers and you've heard this criticism yourself, I'm sure, as you started to get out in the workplace and run into those older generations that got all the power, right? Look at the young and folks, it, you know, talking, you have the, the data here, the percentage that think the pandemic negatively affect them. Is, is there an overhang a little bit here of, and every generation goes through this to some extent, but what is it for the Gen Zers, this overhang of, oh, they're the COVID kids. I've heard that term a couple of times now, or, oh, they're just, they're all going to be depressed all the time. The generalizations and the stereotypes, just kind of answer them for a minute. Yeah. And so this is a huge corpus of people talking about this. And I, again, I think some of it's fair. I think some of it's a bit dramatic and you know, symptomatic of generally how generations regard one another. Older generations are going to look at younger generations and often repeat the same thing that was said about their generation. And that's how life and generations flow together. But I, I would push back and say that I think the most depressed generation is going to be right. And I think in terms of day-to-day -day feelings of depression, I think that Gen Z, the numbers for Gen Z are catastrophic and that and it's also directly proportional to social media use and screen use. And so it's different than the kind of, you know, formerly well-regarded sources of depression and that it's genetic. It's a condition that you grow up with. It tends to run in families. And there's this previously held conception of how depression works. And then there's the symptoms of depression and anxiety that you, you develop over time with large quantities of social media and screen usage. And that's some of what new psychological science is coming out with. And that's what a lot of people are talking about when they're talking about us as the most depressed generation. Um, and that's also why it's important to talk about, because this is a different form of depression and mental health crisis than what we've been seeing before. It's highly, highly correlated with social media use. I mean, I mentioned this before and it's worth mentioning again, but the averages of screen time usage for, for adolescents from age 11 to 14, the average amount of time spent on screens each day is nine hours. Ages 15 to 17, um, over half of that age group is online almost constantly. And so that's over nine hours of usage a day. And the extent to which you use social media, especially for girls, and you use screens and you, you know, are glued to these devices, highly, highly correlates with your outcomes in terms of mental health and your social success. And it, it really comes back to the whole iGen thing. And so to get back to your question, I think that that's the main defining characteristic that's shaping how Gen Z acts in terms of generational behavior and also the main sort of lever that we can try and adjust to try and improve mental health outcomes. And work ties into that a bit because work is generally the antithesis of this. Yeah, Katie Farmer joining us. Kate, here's the, the nut to all this, though, is we know that work can be good for your mental health. Work can also destroy your mental health. Um, I've publicly told people, I was like, one of my regrets is I worked way too hard. I should have been home more. I should have had a more of a work-life balance when I was in the corporate world, uh, even in my military career. And that's a different beast a little bit, but still, you know, I was the guy that never said no. I probably should have said no once or twice in there. That's a spectrum, right? We know whether you're 18 or 80, activity, work, productivity, that's all good for your mental health but we also know it can consume you. It seems to me that the thing with Gen Z or Gen X or even the boomers are still trying to figure this out even as they're aging out a little bit. How do you balance those things? Because the whole key to mental health when you get down to it is always balancing all these different balls we have to juggle as humans. So, million dollar question, give two answers in an essay. How do we balance that work-life mental health balance, especially to a generation that's not only too online, but their work's going to require them to be online. Their social status requires them to be online. The online part's not going away. So how do we start balancing all this out, do you think? Yeah, that, that's really the million-dollar question is how do you balance, what, what forms a well-balanced life and how does work come into that? I think from the research I've done from social psychology and from a lot of really helpful post-pandemic studies about virtual work, I think there's a couple key takeaways that we can think about when deciding the path of our career and our life and how that balance is going to fall. Um, I think firstly is to think about the extent to which you need and the extent to which all humans need social, in-person, physical interaction with others. I don't think, I, I'm not so far into the camp of everyone needs to be in an office or in their workplace in person nine to five every day. I think that's largely a traditional structure that obviously works for some and has a lot of benefits, but you can pursue a more flexible path than just that. 
And I think that assessing your individual needs is important. Assessing the degree to which your current employment in whatever form it comes gives you enough social interaction that you come home at the end of the day feeling satisfied and feeling refreshed and feeling like you've interacted with others in a way that's psychologically satisfying to you. I think thinking about that is important. I think we risk uh, an oversaturation of virtual work and people aren't realizing the extent to which a lack of in-person interaction is hurting their mental health. So I think thinking critically about what you need as a person, um, you know, your basic human needs, but also your individual social needs. There's a lot of variance there. That's the first thing. I think the second thing and that I think Gen Z does a good job at generally is thinking less about the, the money. I think thinking about where you stand financially and what you need to get you out of a hole of student debt or to get you what you need to be happy in life is important. But studies have shown time and time again that generally the amount of money you're making after a certain life point, making more money is not going to make you happier. And thinking about, okay, how much do I need to get by and have the basic needs that I need? Plus, you know, I might have extra wants, like maybe I just love skiing and I really want to be able to ski once or twice a year. I want to work a little harder and build that in. That's that that matters to me. But generally making boatloads of money, the kind of money you see at a high level corporate job is, is not going to make you happier. If anything, this, the studies show that, you know, and psychological data shows that you're going to possibly be less happy because you're losing some of these really core human needs. And so focusing less on money, thinking about in-person social ra- interaction. And then third is probably obvious to older generations, but not as much to Gen Z is thinking about the full diversity of work options available to you. I mean, my generation, those of us entering work right now, we're, we're suffering under high inflation, but we're not suffering in terms of job choice and that we're in a really robust labor market right now that's been pretty resilient. And there's a lot of job openings in the diversity of fields that many of us don't consider or haven't heard of. It can even be in the really large market there is for elderly care or medical assistance and nursing. There's so many really high paying, generally good hour blue collar jobs and in trades, there's needs in education, there's needs across the board that satisfy a lot of different employment needs and a lot of different personalities and skills. And there's more available to us than just the white collar nine to five corporate job. So I think thinking about those three things, about where you're landing, about the social needs that you have and the financial needs or lack thereof, you know, are, are some important things to help find that balance. It's obviously a full recipe, but those are some key ingredients. Yeah, I did a thing recently where I said, I think the days of just having the one job for 40 years are gone. I think you'll see a lot more piecemealing. You'll have a primary job, but you'll also have a secondary job or you'll have a little bit of a side hustle and, you know, you can be different. I think that's where the technology comes in. Folks can kind of find their niches and still have that job that maybe pays for them so they can do the fun thing on the side. I think you'll see a lot more of that, and that'll be part of that balance too. Kate Farmer, we're going to link to the piece. It's in Spectator. Um, we'll link to it. It'll also be in the Substack and all the show notes. Uh, let folks know where they can find you and follow you and keep up with your work until we see you back on Hertel again. Yeah, I would love to come back. I am can be found on LinkedIn, just Kate Farmer. I'm also on Twitter occasionally, Kate S. Farmer. But the easiest way to follow me is just to follow my voice, my work through Young Voices. They have a page up and I'll be posting about that there. Yep, we'll link to all that. Kate Farmer, really appreciate your time. Good piece, good discussion. We'll talk to you again real soon. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you. And that'll do it for this edition of Herd Tell. Wherever you are, you can join us through whatever medium you're listening to. If you're on iTunes, Spotify, iHeartRadio, we're even on some podcasts over in India. You folks in India, we see you on the stats. Welcome. Thank you. Drop us a line. We're all over the world and on any podcasting platform you can think of. Make sure you're subscribing and or following or whatever that platform calls it. That helps us keep track of you, lets us know how you're listening to the program, make sure we can tailor it to get it to you. Heard Tell Show or my name, Andrew Donaldson, on any of those platforms, it'll come right up. But we have a one-stop shop for everything that we do, herdtell.substack.com. It's completely free. Subscribe. 
you get everything right into your inbox. Anytime I write, do a media appearance, do a new episode of Herd Tell. We also have Herd Tell specials. We're going to get back to doing the twice on Sunday recap shows. We also have a huge archive. So we're going to have some specials, some best of things like that. And also some of the food writing from Yonder and Home. We're starting to re up that as well. We got over 600 episodes of Herd Tell in the archive to start porting over. We're going to be working on that. So sign up for the Substack, please. Get you right in your inbox. Never miss anything. Doesn't cost you anything more than a click. Herdtel.substack.com. We sure appreciate it. And follow us on social media. Herdtel Show on the Twitter. Four for the Fire is my personal Twitter handle. No, we're not going to call it X. But if you could share us and let folks know that our programs we're checking out, we sure would appreciate it. So wherever you are, across the street or around the world, we hope you're well. We hope you are well fed. We'll talk to you real soon for the next Hurt Tell. All the music on Hurt Tell is provided under a creative content license from MonsterCat.com. Folks, if you've listened to the Hurt Tell program, you've heard our friend Gabriella Hoffman, but you need to make sure you're checking out her podcast, District of Conservation. It's a podcast exploring the nuances of true conservation efforts from D.C. and beyond. From topic discussions to exclusive interviews with conservation and energy newsmakers, Gabriella keeps listeners appraised of the latest news stories while elevating important voices. Listen to the District of Conservation on Apple Podcasts or wherever podcasts are played. Religion is at the intersection of our 21st century life, even if we don't express a faith. At a time when it seems that religion isn't as prevalent as it once was, it still leaves its mark everywhere. As a pastor, I know that religion isn't something I just do on a Sunday, but it's found in every nook and cranny of my life. Sexuality, politics, social media, the economy, war, nationalism, all have some kind of religious angle to them. And as a communicator, I want to find the stories that can help people understand this part of our society that is so important to so many. Hi, I'm Dennis Sanders, and I'm the host of Church and Maine. Church in Maine is a podcast about the journey of faith and where it intersects with modern life. I look at faith with a journalist's eye, asking the who, where, what, why, and how religion affects some of the major issues of the day. Join me as we journey together. You can listen to Church in Maine podcasts at the website churchinmaine.org or on your favorite podcast app. I look forward to seeing you.